Good morning, everybody from Portland, and this is JJ, and uh, I'm here for day two of DrupalCon, and today I'm going to be talking about Damn Straight, why AI is a clarion call for centralized digital asset content management. Um, this topic came about more about the governance around some of the things we talked about yesterday, which is when you combine AI with atomic content, which is content broken into small chunks, meaning content types and fields, you can do an incredibly amount of new things. And when you do that, it's gonna be imperative for every company to think about the long-term possible implications of managing that ecosystem. Um, so today, we're gonna talk about that. So, I'm gonna start with the central premise that AI is gonna require every organization to think about its content asset and data management strategy from the ground up. And when we talk about AI, we're really talking about two specific flavors of AI. There is predictive AI, which is more about making predictions or forecasts based on data. It can analyze patterns and relationships to make informed guesses about outcomes. And then there's generative AI. And this is about generating new and creative content. It can be used in a wide variety of creative applications, including art, music, and writing. And it can generate biased or inappropriate content based on what the user puts in the application. And I think it's that risk that companies need to understand in addition to understanding that the regulatory framework behind generative AI is still being developed and the land that you're standing on is going to shift. So one thing's for sure, AI is already really, really good, and it's only gonna get better. And for people who have not used Midjourney, Dolly, or any of these sort of advanced applications to create images and videos specifically with language, just understand that it's being integrated into a lot of the applications that creative designers use now, including in Adobe. Photoshop and Illustrator, and it is being built out in many content management systems to facilitate the creation of assets within those applications. There's news every day about new applications being released with generative AI capabilities. And as you can see here, a lot of the work that's being created through these applications is based on the work of real artists, alive and dead. And it's that fact that is the power of the tool. It allows you to create all the cool things that we're gonna talk about today. But it also becomes the imperative to work against, protecting yourself against the inevitable shifting sands that are gonna come when these artists come to claim their portion of the royalties that they are deserved because this is based largely on their work. And they can argue it out in a courtroom about whether or not um, a computer program crawling photos of Annie Leibowitz's art and copying it is like someone actually creating a carbon copy of it or a new version. That's all going to be up to the courts to decide. But as they decide it, I think there's a consensus that the legal terms and conditions from these companies are being written to protect themselves in case there's a, anything that happens. It's not there to protect you. So you're going to need to think about how to protect yourself as you encourage your creative teams to get out there and experiment with these new applications because unless they're trained to understand AI and the risks of AI, they will never be able to actually produce anything with AI that can produce any productivity gains or efficiency gains for your organization. So it's a delicate dance for sure. So a while back, I was asked to present uh, to a user group in uh, Dubai about this concept of 
using language to create images. And I had just gotten my hands on um, Mid Journey, and I had started down the path of experimenting with that, and I had used Dali for some internal work projects. So it was a fun exercise to pick two words that had somewhat universal appeal and put them through different processing engines to see how the outputs compared to each other. So I'm gonna start with some very simple use cases and talk about the potential of AI and imagery. And then I'm gonna grow more sophisticated. At the end, I'm gonna open up an application we built to allow us to create our own prompts and then I'll create some images there together with you and then we'll talk about some of the other concepts about protecting ourselves moving forward. So, golf ball, ocean. The first thing I did is I added a style to my prompt, which means when you put in a prompt in mid-journey, you know, you're asked to imagine a picture of a insert language here. And I could say, imagine a picture of a golf ball in an ocean with a style of contemporary or cartoon-like. And you can compare these two rows to know there's, there's a little bit of variations here. I can add genre on top of that, and you can see how the focus of the art changes. I have uh, the ability to add things like mood states so that the golf ball actually can be seen and situated in different moods, and you can see the coloring and the tints and the tones change based on what that language provides. It's when you start to mix these things that the options really compound. And you can see just by mixing cartoon and pop art or contemporary and sci-fi art, I've got images that are doing completely different things. And then if I really get wacky and I, ooh, typo, mix cartoon-like and happy and contemporary and dreamy, we get other effects. I went for the trifecta and started to mix things up and then I just thought, well, I'm just getting way too sophisticated for myself. I started to add some perspectives to force the, the angle of the camera behind the golf ball in certain ways so you can do that as well. And then you can add things like texture to make sure that you can actually create some of the artifacts that are seen in comic books like this. You can also add locations. And our companies operate in Dallas, Minneapolis, Dubai, India, so I, I created a, a sampling here. But it really is mixing the locations and the colors. You can really see how you can create almost anything if you can formulate the right language in order to elicit the right response from the prompts that you put in. So let's get really crazy and move over to mid-journey. And now I've, I've gone to a prompt builder that's out there on the internet and I've generated out some prompts that are more advanced. And when you generate uh, an image in mid-journey, it generates four thumbnails for you to consider. I pulled all four here so that you could see the different options that the application generated off this prompt. But if you look over to the left, you know, you can add rendering logic so that it renders in, in a specific engine. You can add outputs to add tone and mapping and different effects. As you get more detailed with your prompt, you can ask for maximalist, realistic approaches, etc., to do different things to your image. This is a different mid-journey prompt where I went in a completely different direction where I wanted to make it in the style of Norman Rockwell well and I um, I composed it with the golf ball in the foreground so that we could see different things in the background and you can see the language to form the tone is really creating a different experience at the creative level altogether this is another example, a 3D rendering of a golf ball suspended in midair, inches away from the falling ocean. Um, the atmosphere is adventurous, the colors vibrant and playful. You get the idea. So that's all fun, right? We love it. Maybe. I think the question is, what's going to happen when 
the regulatory agencies catch up to the technology. Because the cat's already out of the bag, so to speak, I hate that phrase, but I just used it. What are we going to do to protect ourselves against what regulatory changes will be coming down the road? And I think because we don't understand how those court cases are going to resolve themselves, the most we can do is really think ahead about how we can mark and tag assets that are used in our marketing and content ecosystems and make sure that we can flag them, audit them, and retract them so that we can show real good due diligence that we tried to do the right thing. And this is where I'm going to segue to a, a short bio about myself, that I spent a large part of my early life in media, public and commercial media. And obviously, if people are mentioned in the news and they don't like it, you know, you can get into a lot of trouble. And and people, people do file lawsuits with good cause sometimes, not with good cause sometimes, but it doesn't matter. You know, it's their right to protect themselves and say, you know, this is wrong, or I want it changed, or I deserve it to be changed. That's almost what's going to happen with AI, because somewhere along the lines, a court's going to rule that the creative property actually goes to the copyright holder. Maybe not, but let's say that happens. And you've had your creative team using AI images out in your marketing ecosystem for a long time, and that's considered part of commercial use because it's part of sales and marketing efforts, and you have to pull those assets back. My question for you is, are you prepared to do that? And if not, what can you do to get prepared? So, who is Kalinda Wiley? He was Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People of 2018, and he was commissioned to paint former President Barack Obama's portrait for the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. He is well-known, he is public, he is alive, and he is an artist that can have his work mirrored in mid-journey. So, to the left, Here's a picture that Kalinda Wiley did of President Barack Obama. And to the right, here is an AI-generated image of almost the same thing, a picture of Barack Obama in the style of Kalinda Wiley generated in Midjourney. So if I wanted to, I could now use language to generate out different pieces of art in the style of artist Kalinda Wiley. I do it with a paragraph of text, but the work that comes back really looks like the creative work that he came up with. So what are the legal boundaries? Well, we're unsure, but in the run-up to this event, I started to push the boundaries. Could I create things in the style of Pixar? Pixar is a gigantic billion dollar company. So if I do this and I have it in my marketing ecosystem, I can probably count on Pixar having lawyers who would care if the rights of this image end up getting passed back to Pixar in a terms and conditions somewhere or by a lawsuit somewhere. So all of this is to say there is a new cause for control out there, and that cause is AI. And when we talk about, you know, the ability to really understand what's going to happen with the law, you have to be almost a legal scholar and a close follower of the court to understand all the machinations. There's different offices getting involved. There's different lawsuits getting filed. It really is hard to keep up with, even if you're an enthusiast. And I guess I'm just going to say that this is the blinking red light on your content operations dashboard that we need to consider moving forward. So how can we protect ourselves? 
Well, I wanted to pull up a use case of a situation where a company had something and they it was out there in the ecosystem and they needed to pull it back. And I've used this in a couple of presentations and it resonated, so I'm using it here, mainly to paint the picture that at the beginning of the pandemic, Kentucky Fried Chicken had to change their logo away from finger licking good because they didn't want people licking their fingers <laughs> and putting it, you know, obviously by their face. So, Imagine you're the head chief marketing officer needing to coordinate this change. You've got all your assets in the ecosystem. You've got the napkins. You've got the, the drums of chicken. You've got the cups. You've got the labels. And they all say finger licking good, and you need to change it right away. You need a way to pull this back. And I'm not going to talk technologies here. I've got, you know, my opinion on different solutions. I use a, a specific technology for my clients, usually around digital asset management. There are many out there that do almost the same thing that I'm going to talk about. So don't worry about the products as much as the concepts. So let's say we have an ad out there in the ecosystem, and it consists of this, a background of chicken, and there's a logo layer, finger licking good. The way that we distribute that asset is it goes from one system across multiple channels. And this one asset can take different form factors based on how it is extracted from the system, meaning maybe it's different sizes. Or maybe the layers are different variations of logos for localization or something like that. But let's just pretend it's one asset going one to many, which is the central promise of composable technology and a digital asset management system approach. So from the creative layer, I have two layers. I have layer one, which is my chicken. I have layer two, which is my logo. And if I store this in a digital asset management system in the cloud, I can generate public links to these layers. And then I can combine those layers into a public link that's merged that brings this creative asset together. And generally in a digital asset management, assets are protected in the dam until they're made public. So the notion of a public link just means putting the asset on the content delivery network so that it can get sent out. But there's the two layers that get combined for the exported image. So you're the marketing manager at KFC and you need to change to no finger licking please which is the new logo. Hey, don't, don't blame me. I, I just made it up. Um, okay, so now I want to keep this background layer, and all I really want to do is swap this logo layer so that with the new ad, it says, no finger licking, please. And we can do that by simply replacing this layer in the CDN and expiring the link to it and replacing this logo. And when I do that, this becomes the new ad that is out there in the ecosystem. And that same concept can be applied to most assets that are stored in the dam, because if it's a logo, if it's, a, if it's an ad, if it's a billboard, if it's in the, you know, a gaming facility because it's a poster, all of these things become options when we can take our creative to the cloud. So with that, I'm going to open up So with that, I'm going to open up a little application that we created within Drupal to help us do image creation. And, you know, I, I explained yesterday that 
I was a new Drupaler because, you know, when we started to prepare for DrupalCon and I had expressed interest in AI, the team had given me an environment and, and I went out to build some of the use cases that I've shown you. We've built out 12 or 13 to make sure that we can explain these different concepts to clients, one of them being image creation. And for this, I went ahead and created some artists that are living, that are relative, that we can experiment with. Created some styles of five different artists. Created some different styles at the creative layer that we can force, and then some perspective. And all it's really gonna do is generate a prompt that we can put in Discord. We had this hooked up to Dolly for a while, but because it was a prototype and the image generation uh, was actually uh, pretty, I don't wanna say bland, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't generating what we wanted to. We went ahead and, and said, we'll do this in mid journey so that we could show the potential. So let's just start out with template DrupalCon. DrupalCon sample. All right, so let's say I wanted to generate a photo in the style of artist Annie Leibovitz, and I wanted to make it just a simple prompt in the style of Annie Leibovitz. I could say golf ball, uh, a photo, a picture of a, let's go scenic, a picture of an, a prairie in the style, a picture of a prairie, and it'll say in the style of Annie Leibovitz. When I generate my prompt, it's going to go out to a prompt service and generate out what it suggests I put into MidJourney. And I can just copy it out. I'm going to go over to my Discord server just as a shortcut so I can do it real quick. If I go into Grandma, ooh. So if I go into my Discord server and I say to imagine and I paste in that prompt, it is going to take some reps to kick off the flows. Here you can see it's at 10%, 20, 30, and then it's gonna generate the image and you can see it resolves in percentages in real time. Now, if I were to open this up in my browser, we've got four variations of pictures that we can consider. I don't know that this looks necessarily like Annie Leibovitz, but it's being passed in the prompt as some sort of forcing of her style. And the question is, is this legal or not? I don't know. So here are some of the other ones we generated yesterday just as an experiment. Imagine a faraway galaxy where in the iconic art style of Andy Warhol meets a pixelated wonderland. We can look at this picture and we can see, looks like John Bon Jovi. Doesn't really look like Andy Warhol, does it? Uh, Madonna. Marilyn Monroe, who knows, but pretty cool. So if I go back to my application now, and let's say I want to do it in the style of Roy Lichtenstein, but I want it to be in the style of a one-line drawing with a perspective of close up, and I'm going to generate a prompt here. Generate a close up. I'm just going to go back to Discord. Oops. Let me go back to Discord, and I'm gonna imagine, oh, that's still the old prompt. Hold on, copy, dunk, here, boop. Sorry for the sound effects.
And as this cycles through, you know, the sky is literally the limit. Here, we just generally created some pull-down menus with some different styles, and then using the AI augmenter in the background, we created an image prompt creator. So let me find generate image. So if I look at the background, act like an image creator is the system prompt. And then we're saying create a mid journey prompt based on the input that captures the user's intent and is creative. Concatenate the fields together in a way that makes sense, not senses. And then we've got the user input here as the capture field to make sure that the augmenter understands how it's generating the logic. So I'm going to go over here. I'm just going to refresh my page and I'm going to say, imagine a picture of a softball player hitting a home run. I can go in the style of Andy Warhol. In the style of stained glass, a perspective of far away. I can generate my prompt. I can take this and I can put it back in Discord and you get it. It's just the ability to understand that the language is the programming into the API to get the outputs from the API that are creative. And the order of the words, the way the words are constructed, whether or not the words complement each other, whether or not they give clear direction to the application about what needs to be created, that is going to be the ball game which was pretty good because that's softball, right? I mean, I get credit for that, right? Okay, well, anyway, uh, this is going to be the ball game because we can force these images to be anything we think they should be. And I think the question is, when we go to put it in the marketing ecosystem, even if we're pleased with the results, how are we protecting ourselves against the people who own this copyright. So this is the end result of that image. That's a pretty good one. I like that one. It's a little bit weird, but hey, it's all, it's all good. So I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint presentation and I'm just going to blow this up again. And I'm going to say key takeaways. The key recommendations to protect yourself moving forward are simply to create flags for uh, the assets in your dam that are AI generated, whether or not um, they are done in a specific application or not. You don't need to get too granular here, but you can. The encouragement would be flag assets. Was it generated by AI or not? If it was generated by AI, what was the prompt that was used so that we can audit against the artistic or the artists in case it, it ever gets, um, you know, in legal jeopardy for any reason? We need to audit the dam it, on a regular basis. I wouldn't say it needs to be, you know, every day or every week, but at least on a monthly or quarterly basis. So you can get a beat on what teams are actually using and doing with AI. And this where this is where, you know, partners can sometimes help to get in and interview your teams about what they're doing with AI. So you've got clear line of sight before you come up with your governance model and you can encourage innovation at the same time, educating teams on what needs to happen to protect you and themselves as you move forward. There's always the right to use digital rights management to enforce some sort of governance over AI assets. Typically, we use DRM for contracts so that we can say, okay, there's an image in the dam and it's from Getty and it can only be used here and by these people. But there is an opportunity to say, okay, perhaps we have an agreement 
where we can use creative works with a, a partner and we can use the DRM functionality within a, a dam to say, you can only use these assets that are AI, or you can only use these types of assets. So it's really about thinking from the strategy from the ground up, understanding that the risk is gonna come from the top down. We can also create watermarks for AI images so that DAM users know what assets are AI generated so they can decide to use them or not. I think that you know because generative AI is being built into Adobe Photoshop and these different applications, it's gonna be so enticing for these creators to use it anyway, but we can within a dam protect the use of those images so that as your marketing ecosystem expands and you start to do more with generative AI, you can protect yourself and make sure that you, you can protect those assets as well. And then I just like to, to have a, a mindset where AI is a great opportunity for creators. We don't want them not using these tools or experimenting because the experimentation is where you're going to get ahead with your teams operationally using AI. We need them to be your foot soldiers. But it's also inherently risky and we need teams to start thinking about the future state in a big way, but also start with very small experiments and incremental steps so that we can make sure that the governance can follow the trends of the teams. And that's going to be, you know, sometimes a tiger chasing its tail unless we, uh, we can focus in the right way. And then the last thing I'm going to leave you with is this. To get maximum value from AI, you need control over your data. And that's every organization's most valuable asset. So I don't think that's news and it's nothing I'm breaking here <laughs> in terms of this presentation. But the key questions I would be asking for the creative folks mainly and the governance folks and the content folks is how should these new tools be used within your organizations? And who's writing the rules around who should use them? If you have a racy who is getting fired if things go wrong, and that person probably should be consulted about what's gonna happen from a governance perspective moving forward. But who's gonna enforce the rules? Who's gonna be auditing these things on a, a, on a regular basis? And how on earth are you gonna measure compliance with a legal uh, challenge if it comes? Because as someone who worked in media for a long time and sometimes had to sit in those rooms when lawyers were asking about media cases about people who wanted things changed and we had to pull things back. Having a, a, a good measured good faith argument behind you that you were trying earnestly to do the right thing and that you, you know, were caught in a mistake is a big difference to saying you actually had neglect from giving no attention to it. So think hard about your strategy moving forward. Dream big about AI moving forward and have a great Wednesday.